Um, okay, I actually think we're live. <laughs> Ayun, okay, we're live. Okay, hi, hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, um, hello everyone. Um, well, thank you for joining us today um, for a special session um, and part of and part and parcel of Fildeb Labs and the Financial Inclusion Labs Innovation Challenge. Um, we'll start in a bit. We'll just let everybody on Facebook sort of get settled since we are blasting this from Facebook. Um, yeah. But we'll just let everyone kind of settle in. Um, okay, so we have a very special session today um, all about data-driven innovation, especially in, um, in the context of social challenges. Um, we all know that, you know, given the, the recent natural calamities and, and other <laughs> challenges that we've been through this year, it is very important, data has always, has, been very important in terms of you know trying to innovate and trying to solve um, things like this, especially in a country like ours. Um, so um, this is really to inspire kind of the the participants that we have here today, um, and and who will be watching this in the future um, to to kind of join. This is really to inspire um, the participants to kind of use data, um, use data in the way that they innovate or in the way that they create solutions um, for, for the country and for nation building. So we have Sir Alan de Venesha here today um, to talk to us about data-driven innovation for solving social challenges. But of course, I want to talk to you guys first about the innovation challenge. So the innovation challenge um, is all about financing the future. Um, it's all about um, financing the future and it's all about financial inclusion. So that's really what we're looking for um, is we're looking for students who are interested in students who are interested in creating innovation and, and increasing financial inclusion in the Philippines and in their communities, starting off with, with their communities. Um, this is our second session. We had one um, last Monday um, about innovate about grassroots innovations and you know creating and developing solutions for your community so now we're going to delve a little bit deeper into um how you can you know how you can sort of create or frame your innovation based on data and on data that you gather yeah so um so if anyone is interested in signing up you can go to the field dev website <laughs> you can go to the field dev website and sign up for our financial inclusion um, innovation challenge in partnership with financial inclusion lab, um, the I believe the deadline for the deadline for this has been moved to November 27. Yes, the deadline for our application has been moved to November 27. So you still have time to sign up. Um, we're we're hoping that um, teams sign up in teams of three to five. Um, so that you know you get you get a good perspective and sort of a well-rounded team. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our speaker for today um, on data-driven innovation, Mr. Alan De Venesha. So Sir Alan is an experienced senior executive who proudly served as a group vice president for an organization that operated in re in the retail, food, export, mechanical, and electrical engineering and business process outsourcing industries. He is passionate about data analytics, strategy, and innovation, and has consulted for global organizations regarding inclusive business models and innovation challenges, like this one. <laughs> International dealings span Singapore, Australia, Papua New Guinea, Central America, China, and the United States. Alan is a graduate of the Asian Institute of Management's Executive Masters in Business Administration, and he recently, recently joined the Development Academy of the Philippines under the Office of the President to spearhead innovative initiatives involving emerging fields such as data science and AI. He 
is the Sur supervising fellow of the DAP DOST project Smart Governance. Yes, we approve of Smart Governance through Data Analytics R&D, Training and Adoption of Sparta. So uh, I'd like to do introduce everyone to Mr. Alan De Venecia. Hi, sir. Take it away. Paul. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, let me just share my screen for today's um, semi-lecture. I'm going to call it lecture, Sana. Boring, you know. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, Paul. So yeah, so uh, I've been tasked, no, um, invite, been invited by Phil Dev to discuss about data-driven innovation. Um, Siguro before I proceed to that, I would like to give a bit of a background about myself, uh, besides the one already given, why actually I am into innovation. So, <clears throat> so my passions are innovation, and I will discuss why um, I'm in that space. Um, uh, strategy is also one of them, given that I'm from a, um, what do you call this? Managerial background um, and um, having been uh, managing some some form of um, multiple organizations in the past, strategy was always in the in the picture. Um, three, three years ago, I was uh, looking for a shift in a career. Uh, data uh, came to me, so I also delved into data analytics, data science for quite a quite a while. But more now, um, yung initiatives ko on data is more on um, e-learning. That's why yung um, uh, Sparta and uh, yung other programs that I've run uh, two years ago about it. And most recently, uh, I've been learning a lot about futures thinking. It's one of the direction kasi of the Development Academy of the Philippines. So there are a lot of um, Asian productivity organization trainings that we've been attending regarding this. And um, I think it's a good mix now of uh, skill sets to have. So basically, ang background ko ng innovation came when I was about to, uh, I think it was when I was about to graduate from AAM. Uh, me and my peers decided to join yung IXL Innovation Olympics, which is also partnership with the Global Institute Man of uh, Global Innovation Management Institute. And there we've tackled three innovation challenges. One was with Vanguard Innovation, which is the largest fund um, uh, equity now um, in the US. Um, we've tackled a business model challenge with them. Uh, we also uh, joined a challenge where we created an innovation plan for the government of uh, Atlantico, Colombia. And um, another one was uh, more or less a part of financial inclusion challenge, which is uh, what Phil Dev is doing now. Um, uh, on with Corporation Multi Inversiones, which is from Guatemala. Uh, we, it's about uh, coming up with uh, different food innovation um, business models that, you know, that are inclusive for the bottom of the pyramid. So, yun yung mga stints ko dyan. And um, ever since, no, I've been actually an advocate of uh, IXL because they have a very good framework in terms of uh, innovation. I think AIM has uh, incorporated IXL within their uh, MSIB program. A lot of the students have been joining this competition uh, globally. So you can compete with a lot of universities like uh, Chicago Booth, um, Halt, and uh, even sometimes uh, people from UPenn join. And so um, the flip side, uh, one of my careers after uh, my stint as a uh, group PP, uh, I've launched um, MOOC PH, which was the one that ran yung Coursera partnership with the DOST that uh, uh, did some scholarship training on data science. We ran, we ran two programs started, which started last 2017, I think, and concluded around the 2019 January. So yung data na stint ko, it's more of a training. Na. So let's go, let's go drive, dive into data-driven innovation. Na. Uh, so data-driven innovation is basically two key words there. Uh, so for our participants, I would like to run through about innovation and what, what, you know, what I think uh, innovation uh, is. Uh, there are a lot of description about innovation, but let's try to simplify that. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll just run through it because more or less between the two words data-driven and, and innovation, uh, innovation you must common. So from the gimme 
uh, innovation management uh, body of knowledge. They define innovation as this. Now it's the creation and capture of new value in new ways. And um, usually, um, when you when you speak of innovation, uh, a lot of a lot of times they will talk about the types of innovation. Um, probably you've come across about with uh, you come across Dublin's ten types of innovation. You've seen some some form of matrix, no four by four matrix that defines the types of innovation. Um, but there's an interesting um, a dimension to innovation which I came across. Uh, going through the Odyssey 3.14 of uh, HEC Paris, and that is uh, the nature of innovation. So nature of innovation, you have uh, a plain typical, when you look at it, sometimes they call it the types of innovation. But, um, innovation comes in many forms, so they could be in a product innovation. Uh, product innovation, there are, there are a lot of examples, you know, iPhone, iPad, anything that you know, commercially available that is innovative, those are products. There are process innovation also. Process innovation, siguro ang pinaka um, long-running example of that is yung, yung Ford assembly line. Um, si Ford was able to create assembly line for cars to build them you know, from hours to just minutes. Um, of course, you have managerial innovation. Uh, managerial innovation, naman, it's, uh, it's a type of... Um, how you are managing your organization. There are organizations, for example, where they allow people uh, to, to define their own sales quota, which is um, not really the normal standard, right? And of course, yung pinaka um, this one type of innovation are business model innovation. This is more of a holistic type of innovation. Those, are, those who are familiar with the business model canvas Basically, um, when you talk about business model canvas, it's a configuration of how your uh, company is set up, you know, how your suppliers, how you deliver your, your goods, what's your value proposition. So basically, there, there could be two competing entities, um, similar industry, but different business model altogether. Right? Uh, classic example are low-cost airlines, for example. So the um, innovation of SEBPAC is basically low-cost, no, no frills na, na flight as opposed to the typical airlines before na um, lahat, uh, lahat paid for and the price are, are higher than uh, sina SEBPAC. So those are typical businesses. Of course, yung sharing economy now, uh, Grab, um, Uber, Airbnb, those are mo business model innovation, speeding off from, uh, from traditional business models and uh, creating different configurations for this model. So, uh, if you have the time, go look for Odyssey uh, 3.14. They have a very good framework for this type of business model innovation. Um, th there's there's one more I'm very interested at because um, uh, recently, uh, as mentioned, I joined the public sector, and um, there are thrives there are sites also trying to institutionalize innovation within the public sector. But I think um, since most of the innovation Practices are coming from the private sector, which is profit oriented. Uh, medyo mahirap sa public sector because you're looking at uh, delivering services to the citizens now without uh, parang shareholder or uh, stakeholder value pabalik, right? Uh, because basically what you're delivering is one way. Um, and I think the dynamic and complexity of in the public sector is more or less siguro parang business model yung dating niya. Um, and it's just, it, it's not typically the the one size fit all na ano yung mga uh, product process managerial so so that that is that is of uh, interest to me also nowadays and then the other dimension of uh, innovation is its depth so it's just a continuum um, a lot of people say in an incremental type of innovation which is optimization basically of some processes for example um, it's not a form of innovation, but for our purposes, it's still a form of innovation. Then, of course, you have the, the most right, uh, the extreme side on the right, which is the, the radical or disruptive innovation, which, which is typically what is associated when you talk about innovation. But, but this, this, this is a continuum, meaning the innovation could be anywhere in between uh, the incremental and the radical. So, enough about uh, innovation. Um, so what are the, the other part of the word? Uh, regarding data-driven is uh, data-driven innovation is basically the data-driven part. Right? Um, 
So before we proceed with that, uh, here's a, an interesting take about data. Um, siguro cliche na ngayon yung data is the new oil and all of those things. No? Um, this one I came across and it says here, um, the new material revolutionizing the design industry today is invisible and intangible, yet we feel it every single day. Uh, that new material is data. So what did, um, why did V9, uh, the CEO of, uh, of Liptaf say this? Basically, from a design perspective, he, he discussed about uh, some milestone in the 1907. And this is the creation of, uh, I think it's uh, Bakelite, which is the first real synthetic mass produced plastic. Now this plastic um, uh, was used to create new tabletop, uh, tabletop phones, which is an, an, an iconic design at that time. So this was 100 years ago. And today, you know, you find that iconic design in uh, our phone icons on our smartphones. So, sabi ya, it's not the the material was data, and what data was that? No, um, basically that data is yung user generated content. Right? Um, basically, <clears throat> siya sabi niya na since familiar yung yung design of that phone before, what prompted designers to create that icon for the phone are are data, the familiar um, inputs from the users. So, so, and this is what, what is really driving the world today. Um, uh, more importantly, big data explosion is really coming from user-generated content. Um, and we can cite a few examples here. For example, in YouTube, you know, there are people uploading 300 hours of new video per minute. And Instagram, um, there are 46, 47,000 photos being uploaded per minute. In Twitter, there are 500 million tweets per day. In Google, you have 3.8 million searches per, per minute. And of course, the Facebook, the largest of them, no? um, with 2 billion active users. You have 510,000 comments per minute, 300, uh, 300 million photos of, uh, uploaded per day. No? And all of this um, data are actually served back to us in forms of services or uh, value-adding um, uh, features, right? And um, basically, when you talk about data-driven um, operations or companies, it's, it's, it's their use of this data uh, to optimize or to give uh, better value for their users. Right? So in Facebook, for example, our newsfeed are curated. Can you imagine 500 friends? How is Facebook choosing which to serve to us? Uh, whenever I stop, for example, nowadays, I see a lot of pictures of steaks on my Facebook page because every time I see a steak picture, I click on it and look, look for the supplier. So down the line, you will see another of steak, right? Um, and Netflix, for example, this is very typical. So um, a lot of my uh, recommend um, landing page, uh, my landing page in Netflix contains uh, <clears throat> some animes, some K-drama because more or less... Some of those are what I watched uh, or binge recently. So they recommend that. Uh, those are being generated through my data. In ways, uh, you have optimal path routing based on user data, right? Um, for those users that, that are using ways, sending their geolocations on the applications, um, it is able to optimize uh, path routing for those that will want to you know, go from point A to point B. Um, Cities have been using cities have been using data to do uh, to address societal problems, um, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll tackle the Chicago City restaurant inspection um, innovation later, uh, which is one of the use cases under this um, uh, workshop. Uh, so been, they've, they've they've been using data to to do some innovative work to solve some of the city problems in New Orleans, for example. You have smoke detectors and fire risk uh, mapping. And of course, uh, the, the far end of uh, the use of data, which uh, you, you might probably be you know, um, hearing a lot of nowadays, uh, is in AI, um, deep learning, uh, machine learning, and uh, its applications you know, um, are increasing day by day. So uh, I don't know if, you, if you've seen somewhere online on the self-driving cars, but I've seen one myself when I was in Arizona. Um, of course, a lot, a lot of, of work are being done also in image recognition, especially in the medical field. Um, 
and and uh, also in natural language processing. So a lot of these are actually all data driven applications, right? So um, they will not uh, work without those uh, data being fed to them. Uh, but the flip side is that um, many organizations, including the government, actually, uh, don't take full advantage of the data available to them. Uh, as a, um, they say uh, that the government is actually the largest um, producer of data. No? So since time immemorial, they've been collecting data. Um, citizen data, um, so PSA alone, we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot of data. Uh, but but uh, we're not really utilizing those now um, to, to, to give uh, the much needed citizen services. Uh, it's a private sector, yes. Right? And, and because Siguro, there is still a very huge lack of understanding of what data driven means. Um, and also there is a general consensus now that there is a lack of people with the proper skills relating to data as of today. Uh, that is why we have programs such as the, the Smarter Philippines through Data Analytics r and Training and Adoption. This uh, program was <clears throat> funded by the OST. Uh, I run it as the supervising fellow under the DAP with uh, our partners, AAP and Course Mac, no? So you can uh, know more about the program at Sparta that at the end of the page. But, but basically what we're trying to achieve here is that we're, we're, we're giving scholarship slots to, to people that would want to learn about data, right? And, and you have six different pathways there. So you can choose you know, from the, from the um, foundational one from data associates uh, to the more hardcore data scientists and data analysts um, tracks or even the managerial tracks. But um, there are efforts being done by the public sector to augment or to support the, the, the industry you know, for it to thrive. So basically to be data driven means having the ability to act on data. So ganun lang siya. For me, that's how simple I would put data driven mean. Um, there are a lot of things you known uh, data driven says, uh, when you say data driven approach, it's, it means that strategically um, decide on things based on data, based on, you'll, ter, you'll hear the terms trends or some type of correlation into, within, the, within the context of what you're deciding on. Uh, but basically data driven encompasses it. Uh, Basically, they also, you know, um, ask you to, to put up an organization that is culturally able to act on this data. Um, so, major top to order actually ang um, data driven um, uh, approach. Uh, and this and this basically um, is asking organization, you know, to be able to uh, capture this value um, along the the chain of the of the data. No? So. So simply put, the, the data value chain is how, how nowadays um, the practitioners uh, see or, or progress no, um, in terms of this value chain. So, so basically, uh, you have the, the leftmost wherein you are able to access data. And the second wherein you, you are able to analyze and process it and eventually store and create it. And more importantly, at the right, you should be able to visualize and, and better yet productize this data. No? So, Classic example of the products that 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 uh, that you know that um, that have been born in data are uh, ways. You know? So that is a data driven app, um, and a lot of things. So data driven innovation um, is the creation and capture of new value in new ways by acting in data. That's how I I see data driven innovation. If you've noticed, it's basically innovation, but uh, the backing of data. No? Kasi, uh, but when you think about it, um, even when we were doing um, in the innovation challenge um, within IXL, they will always ask you to do some form of market research, right? So you're not really, I think there's really not no innovation that is not somehow data driven, right? whether it's small or big. Uh, but uh, I think for the purposes of data driven innovation context, it's more about um, utilizing uh, data, big probably, quote unquote, um, to fuel these innovations. And we can cite a lot of examples. Uh, um, for example, some product innovation. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the House of Cards you know, series on Netflix. Do you know that it's one of the first, if not the first um, series created based on data, meaning, See Kevin Spacey, 
the the theme of the uh, the series and uh, the story behind it no um basically are all um uh data uh defined no so based on netflix uh, mining of the preferences of its users they say if you create a series that is more or less like this people will watch it and it was a big hit and um mga ganun yung i think uh when you search on data driven innovation more or less you come across uh this type of example so, uh but for me um i think medyo ang data driven medyo deliberate yung pagka-design niya um because uh you know for instance that you have to deal with data to do the innovation so uh let's rush, let's run through a use case here um which is one of our uh one of the things i uh, i use during our workshops uh sparta because we're we're doing a scoping workshop uh with our L, with our lu partners um to craft some data challenges on them and uh it is of our the interest of the team you now we we've looked into the civic analytic network from harvard and how the us um cities have been doing uh their um data driven innovations within the context of the uh um the the society problems na na nandun sa mga LGs nila and how how they do how they use data to address this problem so so etong Harvard Kennedy School Ash Center they they have what you call a uh, a framework no it's a 10 step guide um which we'll run through lang quickly um that uh that they use no to to do to to do um this type of innovation that is data driven um within the context of of um uh, the civic analytics network so in chicago um they have 34 inspectors for 15000 restaurants so you can imagine um what a jump pack in schedule ng inspectors so because what they do is they have to go through restaurants to check if they are still compliant uh, why do they do this because uh if they're not compliant there might be food borne illnesses that will come out of them and uh, how did chicago identify you know, um this type of problem to to address well basically uh, there was a news no about a food poisoning restaurant so so basically they fall they, they are falling short in, in terms of inspecting these restaurants because the the balance of the inspector and the number of restaurants are a very huge gap so they want to do a more efficient way to do this so what they wanted was is it possible to increase the speed of finding critical violations of retail food establishment by making it a data driven type of inspection instead of the typical um, flow we're in you know you have the list of the restaurants and you appoint the, and the inspector will have schedules of visits what if a, a data driven uh, algorithm will tell you which restaurant you should be uh, visiting so that's the problem they identified and uh, they wrap this uh, they just they just throw it into a some of uh, an avail, avail, evaluation criteria check if um, this is a feasible or um, this is a problem worth um, addressing and it came out that yes they would want to pursue it so the the next phase of that which is the third one is that um so the team the the team under the chief data officer of the chicago um, government they went with the inspector to somehow deep dive into the operations of how they, the inspectors do their inspections. So when you think about it during the deep dive, it's actually, again, data gathering, right? And once and after they deep dive, um, they are now able to define um, what type of data would they be uh, more or less looking at if they are to, to somehow predict no, um, which establishment will have critical violations. And they open, and they, they largely leverage on open data. So in the end, um, they, they, they figure out that these are the, the data that are relevant. Uh, so business licenses, whether your license number dates, dates and locations from the sanitation complaints, garbage cart requests, and crime. And also your food inspection history. So once they created the model, meaning um, they use all of this data to somehow create um, a model um which we so your model is basically para chang uh, formula um that defines whether or not 
uh, certain restaurants will, will have critical um, um, violations. And this left side, you will see the significant predictors that, 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 um, that contributes to the model. So here you see establishment with previous critical or serious violations, really the average high temperature, nearby garbage and sanitation complaints, nearby burglaries, you have the length of time since last inspection, and even the inspector assigned is a variable now to it. So afterwards, um, they, they, they did a training set um, to, to train the model. And then they use a period, um, which is fast forward to, um, so, so they, did, they used historical data for the training period, sometimes September 2011, February 2014. And then they tested that model using September 2014 to October 2014 data. After their model review, which they say, you know, we're, we're confident that this model is working, they did a pilot and experiment. So in pilot and experiment, basically they, run a, they did a parallel run. Uh, the model um, is listing restaurants that should have been inspected by the inspector if it was the one assigning those restaurants. And then uh, the inspector still went through the, the, the normal uh, scheduling. So what happened was um, they found out that at the 50% level, meaning out of 1,200 example, uh, 1,200 res restaurants, for, for example, at the 600 mark of inspecting, meaning yung the, the inspectors have already inspected 600 restaurants and the model have already um, recommended which restaurants to, uh, to, to visit. No? Mas marami si model na identify na restaurants with critical violations. No? Um, and as you can see the graph in the middle, eventually it tapers off because dun sa dulo, when all restaurants have been in inspected, um, basically 100% na yung, yung nahanap na violation. No? But, but here you can see that the blue one, mas marami siyang nahanap na violation as uh, each restaurant is being inspected. And so at the end, it says na around um, an average of 7.4 days yung, yung bilis nung, nung model in terms of predicting which type of restaurant uh, will have critical violations. No? So um, what does this mean? Um, if you're 7.4 days late, uh, there might be a foodborne illness already um, na mangyayari if hindi na inspecting restaurant. So uh, an earlier detection would have, would have helped uh, the city a lot. So uh, typically um, for projects like this, um, natatapos na siya doon, right? Uh, but um, remember sa data-driven innovation, it's basically creating new ways and capturing value. Well, you capture value when you operationalize something, right? Sabi nga nila, innovation will never be an innovation if you do not capture the value that is supposed to be captured by the innovation. It will just be a, um, an invention. You know? So, um, so you know, per, uh, the, the CDO department, you know, uh, the CDO office of Chicago operationalized this. They've made it into an application where, which they deployed eventually to the inspections office. And um, they, they let it one you know, for six months, for a year. And then they come back and check it. And then they come back and check. So, so basically, that's the framework. No? Um, and there are, there are uh, shorter versions of this. There might be longer versions of this um, flow. Uh, the, the field is uh, still you know, um, like it cast in stone. So, so basically, if you've noticed, the, the intention of the innovation is very, uh, very deliberate. They know from the get go what type of innovative solution they would want to, they would need to come up with. And um, eventually they went and, and tried to seek for data that would, you know, that would uh, help address that innovation or address that innovation. Most of the, sometimes it will, the result will not, not yield to, to a good model and, you know, altogether scrap the data, but scrap the initiative. But uh, basically, that's the that's how it uh, how, that's how the flow is, right? Here, naman sa ating uh, country, uh, there are some noteworthy um, uh, organizations or even individuals and groups no, that have been um, in this field. Uh, 
But here I would mention one of our partners um, uh, in the Sparta program, which is uh, Serolytics, um, which is uh, Sina uh, Dominic Ligot is also part of uh, the AEP. And uh, they've been uh, joining competitions or hackathons also you know, that, uh, that involves data. No? And um, here we see on the right side, um, their winning uh, solution in terms of uh, the winning solution in the NASA uh, challenge, which is the ADIS, um, ADIS project, which is yung, yeah, correlating hotspots with climate and Google searches. Basically, they combine uh, data from Google searches, from NASA satellite imagery. Um, and they were able to predict uh, outbreaks of dengue um, out of this. They, they validated it using DOH data. And so they won that challenge. Here on the left side, they also created a fake news website detection and network analysis for their uh, detecting, you know, which more or less those that's, that, that does, what do you call this? That share content on fa Facebook are purveyor fake news. So all of these are innovations, you know, trying to help um, problems. For example, uh, it would be good if uh, a municipality would know if there is an onset of outbreak already within their, um, area, right? And these are, uh, and alam naman natin nowadays, uh, COVID alone, di ba, pandemic. Um, but if there's an epidemic of uh, dengue uh, about to occur, it would have been nice if, you know, the local government unit would know beforehand no? so they can act uh, appropriately. So uh, these are some society issues, no? Uh, that, that this, uh, um, individuals are trying to tackle. Uh, so more on societal problems, no? uh, because siguro for the sake of our participants in the hackathon, um, there are bigger societal problems out there that talagang ang hirap naman isolve. No? So when you say kasi, uh, societal problems, usually you, you refer to the, the, the wicked problems of society, which is for example, human trafficking. Education is a big problem for the Philippines. Um, of course, climate change is also a societal problem. And usually societal problem or the wicked problems of society, they are more messier, more dynamic and complex. And uh, they're already that complex. You know? Crafting innovative solutions to address them is already hard. And when you throw in big data into the mix, it becomes more complicated. Now, because uh, supposedly data uh, would be more uh, directed, no? but um, a problem kasi is that the data that is supposed to help address the, the societal problems are, are really in this array also. No? Um, there's a Stanford study that says uh, there is a really, there are four principal reasons behind you know, the relative lack of structured big data for societal problems. It's because, well, it's government alone. Um, there are a lot of buried data in administrative systems. Uh, we operate in silos, for example. Um, data ni, data mo yan, so ikaw lang pwede mag-access niya, right? Um, second would be there is really no governance standards in terms of data. Uh, what do you, what they say when I say govern, government standards, basically, how the data are stored in various systems. No? So typical example would, would be, for example, sex, no? uh, male, female. Um, in one system, it's M and F. In the other system, it's male, female. So that's a very simple example. But, but when you go into addresses, for example, how you spell Santa Rosa as S-T-A or S-A-N-T-A um, makes it more or less com complicated to to somehow uh, integrate all of this data for a clean data set to do. No? Um, sometimes data are also unreliable. Um, and a classic sample of an unreliable data is social media uh, data. Right? Um, you, can, you can easily sway votes through trolls. Right? Um, so if they say that, for example, a winning candidate is winning um, based on data, you cannot really take that face value because there might be hidden actors at the back making the, uh, the sentiment unreliable. Right? And lastly, there could be unintended consequences uh, used by data. And that is why you know, 
and and what does this mean? It's basically data privacy. Uh, you put data out there, it could hurt the reputation of organizations of people. Um, the good thing is that uh, we have a very good data privacy um, law. Um, we've been working with them also, the data the, our, our, our NPC. And so more or less in the future, probably uh, we will be able to address that also. You know, the, uh, the issue of trustworthiness in terms of data sharing. But uh, the Stanford study also um, somehow recommended you know, how to address uh, these issues. And I think when we, we go through the list, uh, you will see you know, familiar their recommendations, uh, especially to the, to the last part, but let me just go through it. You know? um, basically building global data banks on critical issues. So there's not enough um, data to go around for researchers, for students like you to act on. And so maybe this could also be something that, that you guys would want to tackle no, in the future. Um, second, I find this a lot, um, uh, especially in the, the recently um, workshop that we're doing and the study mission that we're doing with uh, the Asian Productivity Organization with Seoul. Um, when you look at their innovation um, trusts within the city, they, they always highlight this, no? engaging citizens in citizen science. It's basically um, asking your citizens to be participatory in, in your innovation process. Uh, and that is why we're espousing for open data. Third, which is to build a cadre of data creators and analysts, it's, it's, it's what was discussed earlier. You know? um, there's really a lack of data practitioners uh, out there. Um, so if the private sector, you know, is requiring uh, a huge talent pool for data job, uh, for data related jobs, what more for the public sector? Right? And lastly, there should be a promotional thing uh, that promotes virtual experimentation and platform, which is, which is what we're doing now, actually. This hackathon by Field Dev, it's some part, it's some type of virtual experimentation platform wherein you ask people to somehow help address the issues of uh, society. And yun, no? so uh, SESPART also will be launching some of those next year. Um, and you are more than happy to um, join us also. And so I think that concludes my talk. It's, not, it's about almost 4.50. Um, and so I leave lang again, no? Uh, look back. The new material revolutionizing every aspect of our lives today is data. No? Even our innovation uh, thrust no? is being affected by data. Um, and yeah, so thank you uh, very much for having me and thank you for Phil Dave for inviting me over. I hope um, our participants are able to get a glimpse you know, um, the importance of data and how they can use it to drive their innovation efforts further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Alan, for that um, very comprehensive um, talk. Um, and before, you know, we just we can just get through like a few questions and, and you know, just to kind of deep, deepen our understanding of it. So, so Sir, um, just for everyone's understanding, what are, where, let's start off with, where can we find, like as innovators, where can we find reliable data aside from PSA? <laughs> actually, PSA, yeah, re reliable yung PSA, but um, actually a lot of their data are not yet in usable format, meaning they could be scanned documents. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of actually open data initiatives, repositories online. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, you have a lot of our agencies like uh, ASTI, uh, so the OST, you have from, um, what do you call this? Uh, internationally, di ko kasi ma-mention ngayon yung mga, mga agency lang. It, it's, it's eluding in my mind. No? But for experimentation, there are a lot of sites, for example, Kaggle, wherein you can download a lot of data sets, uh, global data sets no? that you can play around with. Uh, but for specific to the Philippines, um, 
there are agencies na na nagkikip nun. No? So, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so it's available. I mean, there's a lot of open source naman online that they can like go siguro na hindi naman like, you know, that's complying with all the data privacy and all of that. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, siguro, uh, ang magandang uh, again, the group of uh, Dominic, they're running a BARM data challenge. And I think they have a very collective uh, list of uh, people in the Philippines. Okay. Uh, yung ADB data challenge um, gives some of these data sets. Sinasa challenge have, have access for all of their satellite. Oh, yeah. Satellite business. Yeah. Mm-mm. Yeah, I think NASA also gives, but they give a lot of uh, resources eh, during yung mga space, uh, yes, uh, space, space apps uh, nila. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay. So, as as a um, country, as, a, as I guess, how can we better, like, how do you think, sir, um, not to really criticize them, like anyone, right? But how do you think we can better um, make use of the or rather actually how can we better collect um data what what area siguro in in society or do you see that we can still you know improve our data collection or data collection will really be kind of crucial in solving these issues so so for example in the public sector um local government units uh based on our workshops with uh, the three lgus under sparta uh, we we hear of we hear often no, uh, that they are trying to migrate into into um, information systems. Uh, there are data within the LGU that they, they are still manually being collected. So I think um, if you look at Singapore and Seoul, for example, or even Barcelona, no, uh, those use cases that we've been studying, a lot of the LGU data are actually being Posted online as an open data collect uh, data repository you no know, so open data initiatives nila. and I think we can start there no um the LGO okay. or even the NGAs uh, have a lot of data ju- based on their operations lang day to day activity mm-hmm. yeah okay so for example sir yung ano yung let's let's use siguro yung yung recent typhoons <laughs> as yeah. as an example. So how do you think or like what innovations or what rather actually what solutions could we have um used to prevent or not not really prevent but like to you know dealt with the the disaster better Um you know it it yung kagayan Okay so they, they, there was there was there were viber messages asking uh do you know of people that will have a solution for early detection of flooding. So <laughs> basically, um, sabi ko, you know, look, DOST has, I think, um, and and for me, yun yung ECS, eh. like, if you have sensors yeah. that will collect yeah. and it's a real-time thing, um, yun na yung pinaka low-hanging fruit. No? So Mm-mm. I think for those lowlands, lowland LGUs, especially, yeah, you know, flood prone areas they should have these sensors no so it's it's different kasi when you say na you know uh yung type of storm like yung recent the last one is like one out of whatever no? um <laughs> you don't you don't really uh see the gravity of it until it hits you yeah yeah so and and this solutions are already available right so i yeah. mean the potential damage of not Installing it, it really outweighs the, the 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 cost of the equipment itself. Yeah. Mm-mm. Yeah, and it, is it is it? I know I um there are a lot of you know being smart cities in general is yes. just they basically being a data driven city, right? Um um, and I know that um let's say I think I think like places like Dubai, they have road sensors to really, you know, gather the traffic. I know. So are those things that you think we could implement here also? Or are we, what is lacking? Like, what is oh, oh, def- Definitely, no? So, uh, paano ba? Well, yung, 
yung when you look at the first world country no it's it's really a top down initiative right it's yeah. the power yeah. the mayor no? to say that we, we need these things right and we have to move yeah. in and you should have innovation champions across the the entire um organization to mm-hmm. ensure that it, it gets applied no? um the technology are there already yeah in source um sabi nga nakakatawa nga because I was talking to a mayor and um who who is the leading one in terms of smart city no uh um sabi niya when you talk about smart city sabi niya usually mayors will, will think it's it's CCTV lang no? so <laughs> more than that no so um ayun siguro uh, i think yun sabi ko kanina there is really a very large gap still in terms of the lack of understanding what this thing what this thing yeah is. Okay. Okay. So, um, um, given sir, um, so just to kind of wrap up just a little bit, um, given that ayun nga, it it takes a lot of, um, red tape and you know it it takes a lot of red tape and going through certain processes and convincing people in power. Because nga kaya, diba, Especially for big changes to create smart cities, you really have to go top down. So for our innovators, for the people joining the innovation challenge. How, parang it seems like such a daunting task, na to be data driven because there is none, or rather there's very, you know, there's very little to work with. So how how do you, parang how can you advise them, na to be so more data driven given what we have? Let me correct that first. So um, <laughs> uh, data driven, not necessarily it means big data, right? So okay. data driven in, in, in initiatives or innovations that can be addressed now with. Mm-mm. right amount of data siguro but um ang mas ang mas i think when you try to tackle societal uh societal issues Mm-mm. especially if you include public sector is that you think that creating a product for a particular uh what do you call this part of the public sector okay uh that product will work Uh, dun, dun ako na amaze because actually when you look at the government tahi tahi kasi siya right like yeah. there might be um, governing bodies governing certain agencies there might be mm. documents needed by this agency that is coming from another agency and when you're trying to create a solution for this agency you do not factor this thing that's why when you try and implement this thing on the agency you you suddenly hit a roadblock and say oh we cannot do that because COA doesn't like it or some agency says uh, we have to connect to them first before. so so i think um our innovators should just be mindful of those no um uh that's why we, us as sa DAP are also looking into this do one sense mm-hmm. maybe we can help facilitate more Um, movement of this innovation drive it in the the sector, especially you're trying to to do societal issues. More mm-hmm. or less, you will have to uh, interface with the the government, right? You know, before like financial inclusion. No? Um, of course, you know, uh, kudos to the private entities that will have no um support for 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 these initiatives. But I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, Uh, the government should be put in the mix if you want it to be a very sustainable uh, yeah. environment. Yeah. something to be considered talaga when you create your business models to all the innovators yes. out there. Um, okay, sir, um, last question lang. Kasi, of course, we kind of encourage our innovators kasi baka matakot sila eh. So we encourage them to kind of start at, their, at the community, at the grassroots level. Yeah. Because, you know, you can't really solve the big issues right away you can't solve them so so sir how can we how can they um sort of collect their own data you know how can they start being data driven you know parang parang they don't have to rely on you know solely on what's out on the internet parang what is a non complicated secure way of being data okay, um i think let's let's take for example no um the, the case of avis Hmm. And I, I, I've also uh, came a, another presentation with with one of the leading firms. Now, so I think there was Thinking Machines. Um, ah. Sent she sa, sa PIDs ng kanyang work regarding economic. Mm-mm. 
uh, web indicator. I think you can use proxy data kasi. So think of it na parang, so for example, if PSA is conducting survey for something, to engage an economic indicator, there might be proxy indicators that, that will lead to that. For example, see this, no? Um, Siyempre, to know if there's an epidemic, DOH data is, is saying that some hospitals, there are chick kids that, are, uh, ha that have dengue. So there's yeah. a concept of epidemic. Yung ginawa nila is that they went into Google and they, they, they check if there are Google searches for dengue symptoms, right? Mm -mm. And so if a particular municipality, you have a sudden surge of people searching for uh, dengue symptoms for a particular month, yeah, could be a proxy that there is uh, some type of thing going on in terms of <laughs> yeah, and this could this could serve as proxy. And, and so ganon So I think there there are a lot of literature out there already about some of these solutions, which our, yeah. our participants can can probably go into, and then they can validate it on the ground. So they do the the old school way of validating it through surveys or... Huwag na sila. Validation na lang. Door to door. Validation na lang. If they still do it or if there's yeah. anybody doing that validation for them, the better they are. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you, Sir Alan. Um, um, I'll allow you po to give um, your parang final words <laughs> to inspire our innovators. Ayan. Um, yeah. So, innovation, no? um, for me, it's a continuous process. Minsan kasi, uh, uh, ang lagi kong sinasabi is that there should always somehow be a product market fit at the end. Um, yeah. yeah. A product market fit is basically a validation that what you're thinking resonates with to the, to the, to the one going to be benefiting it. Kasi if there is no feedback like that, there is no continuous um, innovation in terms of that. It's, it's just going to be an idea in the market. For for our hackathon no, um, participants, I think uh, kung gaano nyo kabilis try to validate what you're thinking and what you're trying to innovate the, the better for you off. No? Instead of just sitting there and thinking that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, try to reach out to your uh, target market and, and somehow validate it. No? So, mm -hmm. so yun lang sa akin. Um, it's, it's not it's not good to be tied up in ideas that you're, you're trying to launch no um uh, per se na na na, mag, na hindi magkakaroon ng, ng fit uh, for it yeah okay. thank you so thank you again so much sir alan for sharing your time and your insights with us uh, again we hope that everyone will take data into consideration when you um join our challenge um so you can um, go to our website, phildev.org, to find out more about the um, Financial Inclusion Innovation Challenge. The deadline is, has been moved to November 27. You know, we just also want to give consideration to all of those who have been affected by the recent, yeah. um, the recent storms. Um, we know that a lot of people still don't have electricity, still are having a hard time. So, of course, and, you know, financial inclusion also really helps in disaster yes. preparedness and disaster resiliency. So this is really the chance to kind of help the country, you know, parang para umahon tayong lahat, kapit bisig tayo lahat mga kaibigan. So again, thank you, Sir Alan, for sharing your time with us. And we will see you guys at our next session. Bye. Bye. Thank you.